me, ARC UK YouTube channel. I am Hard Money Jim, and I'm speaking today from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, where the weather and scenery are spectacular, we're, we're at the height of the summer here, and it's really kind of the perfect time to be here. Now, we're going to do something uh, a little bit different today, and I'm really excited about it. Uh, I am joined today by Professor Brian Simpson, who is speaking from an equally beautiful place, La Jolla, California, where the surf is up and I'm sure the sea breeze is sweet. Uh, how are you doing, Brian? I'm doing well, Jim. Hello. Good. Good, good. Glad, looks like you're loud and clear to me. Glad. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Okay, yes. well, thank you for coming today, Brian. And let me introduce you and, uh, and let me introduce what we're going to be talking about today. So Brian Simpson is a professor and chair of the Department of Accounting, Finance and Economics at National University in San Diego, California. His research focuses on monetary and banking theory, the business cycle, the philosophical foundations of economic ideas and the requirements of a free society. He's author of a recently published book, uh, A Declaration and Constitution for a Free Society. That's this book right here. And in addition, he's the author of a two volume comprehensive exposition and defense of Austrian business cycle theory uh, entitled Money, Banking and the Business Cycle. And he's also author of a book, his first book called Markets Don't Fail. That's Markets Don't Fail with an exclamation point. I mean, they really don't <laughs> fail, right? And, uh, uh, and Brian has a PhD in economics from George Mason University. He's got an MBA from Pepperdine University and a bachelor in science in aerospace engineering from Syracuse University. So welcome again, Brian, great to have you here. Now, Brian and I are old friends. Actually, only one of us is old. That's me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, over the last 20 years or so, we've had a great many discussions, usually over a long lunch. And uh, so today, I guess we're going to recreate those, only be a little more structured. Uh, today, we want to talk about um, Brian's work and especially spend time discussing this book, A Declaration and Constitution for Free Society. So, Brian, can you briefly, uh, you know, tell us about this book? Um, what's its premise? What's it's all about? What, what is it all about? Right, right. Thanks, Jim. You're young in spirit, though, right? <laughs> you dang right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I mean, this book, the Declaration and Constitution for a Free Society, I I think the Declaration and Constitution need to be revised to help protect individual rights and, and freedom in, in a better fashion. Uh, now, let me say, though, at the outset that given the current philosophical and political climate, the main intention of, of the book is not to revise them in the hope that they'll be used really as a template to create versions of these documents anytime soon, revised version. So, uh, you know, I, I conceived of this project really in, in uh, 2014 after I finished and published Money Banking in the Business Cycle. Uh, so, and, and I thought it would be a great way to learn about the constitution and, and the declaration. And I thought it would be a great way to teach other people about those documents and about how to protect individual rights and freedom ultimately. And that's, that's what I see as the main purpose to revise the declaration and, and US constitution uh, as an educational endeavor, uh, especially the constitution. Uh, so, so the purpose is really to help readers understand you know, how these documents can be modified so they consistently uphold and, and protect the values of, of individual rights and freedom. And I think it's, it's great to use these documents because they're well known as documents that protect rights and freedom, but, but it can be improved in terms of the protection that they provide, uh, especially with, with regard to the constitution. Uh, so, so hopefully. So, so yeah. So, so what, you know, you were all, you're already accomplished. You, you've written three books and one, a very, you know, extensive two volume uh, on money and banking and, and business cycles. So, was this an attempt to integrate your knowledge further? Because, because you know, there are big commonalities 
between what used to be called political economy and economics today. So was that a motivation? I'm just kind of curious what the lightning, when the lightning went off and says, whoa, I got to write a book on the Constitution. <laughs> Not many economists would do that. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I, I wanted to learn more about the Constitution. It, 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 there was a lot of research up front before I started writing at all uh, uh, on this book, uh, before I did any writing whatsoever. Uh, so, I mean, the desire was to learn about the Constitution and Declaration and teach pe other people about rights and freedom. And yeah, it is an integration. It's an integration of, of economics, of law, of, of uh, political philosophy, and, and of ethics as well. So, you know, the right, it, it requires a, a knowledge in a number of areas, because I've talked to, to, to some lawyers about create or revising the Constitution, and they, they all seem to be a little bit put off about the idea. But I don't think they understood, that, because they thought, yeah, I mean, you can say that what you want to do to protect rights, but the, their attitude seemed to be, well, so what, though, if you say that? And my view was, well, you know, that's an important requirement for human life, and we can show the, the economic implications, the practical implications of protecting individual rights and freedom, and, and as well, show what happens when they're not protected from a practical standpoint, that, that human life is harder to live, that it goes, you know, goes against those requirements and economically uh, that that standards of living are lower as well. So that integration between economics, law and and uh, political philosophy and and ethics is extremely important. And, and so that just just an overall desire to learn more about the Constitution and teach people about rights and freedom, really. Yeah, I like what I like what you said there about you, you were alluding to the practical payoff, you know, to the sort of a cash value of this kind of thinking, and it definitely does uh, have, have a cash value. Um, so uh, tell you what, um, I was, I was going to get into, uh, let's, let's t before we get back to your book in detail, uh, I want the audience to be sure they understand a little bit about you, just briefly. Now, you got, had a Bachelor of Science degree in aerospace engineering from Syracuse. So like you were a rocket scientist, right? Yeah, yeah. You can you can call a rocket engineer at least. I did work on rockets, actually. Yeah, out of out of my undergrad, and like you mentioned, a BS in aerospace engineering. And, I, and so when and how, yeah, and when and how did you tr did you transition in, into economics? Right. Well, my first job was at what used to be McDonnell Douglas uh, in their space systems company, but it's now now Boeing in Huntington Beach, California, so Southern California. And I was working in their Delta launch vehicle divisions do, uh, division doing uh, 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 was separation analyses, they call me. So separating stages of rockets from each other. You can't have them banging in, you can't have parts banging into each other and you gotta cleanly separate spent stages. So I was doing that kind of analysis. And I went to, through the Pepperdine MBA program at night uh, while I was working there. And, and that's really where I found an interest in economics. Uh, I had George Reisman uh, as, as a professor. He was teaching in that program. And I had him for two classes, a price theory class uh, in economics and, uh, and then national income policy. And so that's really where I found my interest in economics and, and where I was introduced to uh, objectivism and Ayn Rand, because I, before then, I had never heard of Ayn Rand or objectivism. I didn't know anything about her or, or her books or, or anything. Uh, so so uh, I was introduced to, uh, he, he used his book, Capitalism, A Treatise on Economics in that class. And, and at that point, when I was taking his classes, it was in a pre-publication stage. It was, you know, just a manuscript. <clears throat> <clears throat> but he also used uh, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, used von Mises's Human Action in the class. So, so that was my introduction to economics. I had never had an economics class, and and I really had an interest in it. Uh, I I 
uh, eventually, you know, I, I eventually was able to, well, I asked him if I were to go on and get a PhD in economics, where should I go? And George Mason was one place that he recommended to, to go. So eventually I, I quit my job and went back to school full time, moved across the country to Fairfax, Virginia, outside of D.C. to go through George Mason's PhD program in economics. And now I'm back in California. You again. know, I mean, I, I knew, I knew, I knew a lot of that story, uh, some of the details. But um, one thing that uh, one great thing you and I have in common is an admiration and a friendship with George Reisman, uh, who I consider a, a great, uh, a great advocate for free markets and a great thinker and a great economist. And I know you do too. Um, and uh, I, I. Uh, I wasn't aware that he was a, such a direct influence, uh, you know, on on your uh, on your career change there. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so uh, with that excursion, I, I I thought it was it would be nice to establish uh, that background um, on our on, on for the you know forty or so minutes we have today left. Um, Here's what, here's what I'd like to do. I want to be sure that you're okay with this. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, I have a few general questions about the premises behind the book, uh, and, you know, particularly your, your views on individual rights. And, and then, then I'd like to talk about how your revised constitution would apply or would have applied to uh, some current issues. For example, the government's policies during the pandemic. Then, then I'd like to briefly discuss the Declaration of Independence and a key change, a key change you made to that document and why. Then, of course, there's stuff like the Commerce Clause, and I still want to leave time to talk about money and time permitting after that, the Second Amendment. Now, that's really ambitious, all that. So if we don't have time for, if we don't have time for all that, we'll just have to. Uh, uh, but is that OK with you if we just proceed that way? Sounds good to me, yeah. Okay, well, good. So, so your book is all about defining the limits of government as a protector of individual rights, and mm -hmm. and and that the uh, the only proper role of the government is to protect individual rights. Is that I've mm -hmm. got that right? Correct. Yes. All right. And so, in other words, people have a right to act in their own interest as long as they do not violate the legitimate rights of others, but. But here's my question. Now, I'm going to be devil's advocate here a little bit. Mm -hmm. Stated that way, some would say that's a little problematic. I mean, let me be devil's advocate. Some would say that always acting in your self-interest is a license to do harm to others. For example, they might say that, let's just take an example, price gouging during, a, uh, during a, an emergency like a hurricane takes advantage of poor people or helpless people. And some might say these people have a right to be treated fairly. So the government needs to intervene to protect the rights of those who are, you know, vulnerable or helpless. So what, what about this price gouger who sells gasoline at high prices, high prices after a hurricane? Isn't he, by acting in his self-interest, really injuring someone else who can't afford to pay the price, you know, the price? And, and don't various laws and regulations preventing activity like this protect the rights of the vulnerable and the powerless. Is there something wrong with what I said there? <laughs> well, I, I mean, first of all, if you're talking about purchasing goods, uh, one always has the right to refuse to purchase certain goods. Uh, I, I think, though, with regard to your example, uh, uh, with regard to so-called price gouging, which is just charging a higher, you know, they, they, that's sort of a, uh, a pejorative term that people use to make it sound like a, a bad thing when it's really somebody just acting within the context of their rights. They have gasoline, it's their property. They have the right to try to charge really whatever they want to get people to buy it. And and if prices are allowed, able to, to rise after a hurricane or, or uh, you know, in certain situations, what that does is it actually helps people further their their self interest in their lives because if you had an area hit with a hurricane where gasoline was in short supply, raising the price signals to other areas of the country that that there's a great demand for this good in this area, especially relative to other areas. The, the supply might be low due to the hurricane. And so 
that encourages others to bring their supplies to that area. So I would say it, it actually doesn't harm the ability of people to act in their self-interest. It, it helps them uh, to do so. Uh, you know, I, I, I use these example kinds of examples all the time in my classes that say if we have an earthquake here in Southern California and that cuts off a large portion of the water supply due to pipes breaking and so forth. Well, what we need more than anything else is for the price to be able to rise to signal to the rest of the country or surrounding areas at least that are not affected uh, by the earthquake to bring in water supplies. And I've heard stories of uh, uh, temporary pipelines in the road being laid down in response to things like this, or people, you know, putting wa uh, bottles of water, buying water, wa water, say bottles of water in Las Vegas to bring it into San Diego, uh, you know, to sell that water at higher prices, but that, that attracts the supply. So uh, yeah, I mean, that can Perception of 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 somebody acting in their self-interest trying to harm others. It's really an altruist conception of, of self-interest. It's not, in fact, in your self-interest to go around harming others like a criminal, but acting in your self-interest does entail your ability to charge prices that you want to charge for products or property that you own. And ultimately that benefits everybody, even in those kinds of cases that you're talking about. Yeah, I guess another way to say it is it's in everyone's interest, therefore everyone's self-interest to, to uh, let markets uh, uh, determine the price. Um, so, I mean, one of the great one great value of your book, I thought, is, is a, is a uh, reference to current events. And as a study guide to help you study in current events. Uh, in, in the USA, for example, uh, the interpretation of our Constitution is in the news all the time. I mean, if we look at Supreme Court decisions and various controversies like abortion and gun rights, and uh, states' rights versus federal authority and climate change legislation and, and the, the constitutionality of that, vaccine, ma vaccine mandates and so on. The list goes really kind of on and on. And because when the Supreme Court makes a decision and it's in all the news, they almost always refer to a, uh, a, a section of the Constitution to justify their decision. So your book, I think, is a great reference to ask you know, what did a very thoughtful free market economist, that would be you, have to say about the Constitution on this? Uh, I wonder, did, and I guess, is that, the, is that the benefit you had in mind as a study guide when, when you were, you know, doing this work? Well, uh, I, I, that's a part of it. I think the main benefit, I think, was, uh, and, and the knowledge I knew I possessed, which would be extremely important when writing the book, is my knowledge of what rights are <clears throat> and the philosophical basis uh, for rights. Uh, but having knowledge as an economist <clears throat> in terms of what happens when rights are protected or when they're not protected, I, I think that application it is important to see, okay, so, so what? Why do rights need to be protected? I mean, fundamentally, they're uh, uh, crucial to human life, obviously, but what does that mean? And, and I think that's the, the objection that the, many, some of the lawyers that I've talked to have had, that they, they, they could understand that, yeah, rights need to be protected, but, you know, what, what does that mean? We tell people that how do you convince them that they should be protected? And, and the way you can convince them is that integration with, with economics, talking about, you know, I talked about a number of issues with regard to the pandemic and the business cycle, social security, regulation, and, and the Second Amendment as well. <clears throat> so I talk about a number of these things and look at the, the practical implication of protecting versus not protecting rights. Um, okay, well, so... Um... That's a good. That's a good opening to, for me to ask you about the pandemic. So, from an individual rights perspective, and from your perspective in in writing this book, uh, what was wrong with the governments? Whether we're talking about the uh, the the local or national government, what was wrong with their response to? the COVID pandemic. I mean, we had lockdowns and mass quarantines and mask mandates and mandatory vaccinations and so forth. Would your revisions to the constitution have prevented, if 
if they you know, were in place, have prevented this, what I consider a disastrous overreaching government, government response to the coronavirus. Yeah, I think it would have helped uh, immensely. For one thing, uh, <clears throat> you know, the massive amounts of welfare that's been provided through through the pandemic, or at least justified by the pandemic. Uh, you know, I, I know this is the, the focus. Uh, the, what you focus on is often money. You know, you look at the increase in the money supply, and that has gone on in the U.S. and the massive increases in spending that that has financed. Uh, that that would not have happened. Uh, yeah. I think people need to be prepared for, uh, you know, a, a rainy day, basically. This is a big uh, rainy year or a couple of years, I guess you could say. But they need to save. They need to be prepared. We have uh, the boom bust business cycle that's been going on, you know, and, and I would claim that that's caused largely by government interference, government violations of rights in the monetary and banking system. So people need to be prepared for this. And, and I think it should be voluntary charity, ultimately, that helps people. If they can't help themselves, uh, then then they have to turn to voluntary charity. That, I don't think the government should be should be uh, providing funds to people for that reason. But, you know, with all the the, the payments during the pandemic, uh, fewer people were working and the lockdowns as well. I mean, that's just a, a direct violation of rights, shutting down businesses, claiming they're, they're quote unquote, not essential. Uh, I mean, that's uh, that's extremely harmful to be to people being able to further their lives and well-being. Uh, I, I think what how the government should have responded was, I mean, one thing that they can do or a few things is to, to test people for coronavirus and do contact tracing and quarantine, quarantining if you're infected to try to limit. But that doesn't entail lockdowns. That doesn't entail massive amounts of welfare. Uh, people need to, to work to further their lives ultimately even through these kinds of episodes and and if people need to adjust they they can do that on their own and businesses to a great extent did adjust uh, on their own uh, and and i think would have done so more to 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 accommodate these uh, this kind of uh, situation so i think something a point you made in your in your book uh perhaps or pe perhaps it was an interview i heard you in sometime or another you made the point, uh, I think it's a common uh, objectivist point, that the government would have to show that people, someone was an objective threat to uh, someone else's health or well-being or life in order to restrain them. Uh, that's a, that's a, a, I don't know if it's the basic, but that's a basic principle involved here. Am, am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't just lock down an entire state like in California just because there, there is, there's an infectious disease out there. You have to show, there has to be evidence that somebody is a threat uh, to yeah. other spreading yeah. disease. And of course, it may not be that person's fault, but you still can't let them, you know, go around and uh, harm people if you know. But the point is, yeah, there has to be an objective, objective knowledge of it. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so... Um, yeah, so I think it. I think it's pretty clear that um, without lockdowns and without quote stimulus, yeah. we would be living in a very different world today. I mean, I don't know about you, but my world seems to have changed a lot in the last yeah, yeah. two and a half years. <laughs> okay. But I don't think prices would be rising as quickly and, oh, and we no. would have issues because even with uh, the FDA's response uh, to the, the outcome of the vaccine, I mean, I think the FDA probably delayed the vaccine maybe four or five months uh, because they they had the the vaccine or, or at least the basic, uh, I guess, chemical structure even before the, the, the pandemic had shown up in America. Yeah. Uh, so many more lives might have been saved if it were not for those delays that the FDA traditional and it traditionally causes delays in the development of drugs. Yeah, I mean, we can't get into it today, but there's, <laughs> there's a lot we could say about treatment, lack thereof uh, uh, and, and, and behavior of the uh, FDA. But uh, but that's for another day. Um, right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, now the title of your book is A Declaration and Constitution for a free society. Right. Now, you actually talk relatively little about the Declaration of Independence. It's fairly short, of course, uh, compared to, you know, 
And and I guess my first question is, the declaration has no, as far as I know, it has no legal uh, teeth. In other words, it's not part of our body of law exactly. I could be wrong about that. Um, so why why did you want to take on the declaration? It, I mean, it is an important document to us in terms of thought and culture, right. but I'm curious what you thought about that. Well, some legal scholars have actually argued that, that it is a part of the law of the land. It's what created the U.S. Uh, oh, I, I was not aware of that. The U.S., yeah, it was founded uh, July 4th, 1776, which we just uh, went by. Uh, yeah. You know, it wasn't founded at the time that the Constitution was ratified years later. Uh, but but when the, the Declaration was uh, was ratified or approved. So so in that sense, I think it is the law of the land. And, and I've read scholar to state arguing that that's that's the case but it's certainly even if you you wouldn't somebody wouldn't claim that it's it's the law of the land or part of the law of the land it's it, it influences the law it's a guiding document that the law should people creating laws should look to in in uh, uh, implementing them and, and creating different laws so I think that's that's an important uh, aspect of the declaration and uh, you know I I think it would be uh, extremely beneficial if governments in the U.S. at all levels and, and around the world would make declarations again uh, in the U.S., I guess it would be to, to uh, reclaim the idea that the purpose of the government is to protect individual rights. And, it, and that could be at the federal, state, and local level. Obviously, they wouldn't make declarations of independence, but declarations to reaffirm the protection of rights by the government. That, that I think, is extremely important and, and would be important for creating peace and prosperity around the world if governments understood the importance of that and, and actually engaged in that. Well, that, that's, that's, uh, that's very well said. Now, I'm going to uh, read briefly. And you can comment. So I can just quote from memory uh, what the declaration, the, you know, key passage, what it actually says. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And here's what you write. We hold these truths to be undeniable, not self-evident, mm -hmm. that all men are born equally free, not created equal that they possess based on their nature as rational beings, certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Right. So there's about three or four points there. You say undeniable truths, th th these truths, these rights are undeniable, but not self-evident. Could you comment on that, on your change there? Right. Yeah. So, uh, the truth being undeniable. I mean, the fact is, uh, there are a number of things that the Declaration is claiming to be self-evident that aren't, in fact, self-evident, that we possess inalienable rights, what those inalienable rights are. So, so they're not self-evident, but they are, they, they are undeniable. They can't legitimately be denied. And in fact, in Jefferson's uh, draft of the Declaration, he, he used the term, instead of self-evident, he used sacred and undeniable. Uh, so mm. he used that term undeniable, at least. And, and so I think that's, from an epistemological st standpoint, uh, a better use. Yeah, I was, about, I was about to comment. You're, you're, schooling the, you're schooling the founders in epistemology. I like this. <laughs> I like this. Okay. So all men you say are... No, you have another comment? Yeah. Well, well, just let me say, I have enormous respect for the founders. But, oh, yes. But I, but, I, but, I, 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 but I think it, you, we, can, yeah. we can learn something from going through this and, and improving upon it. Uh, yeah, um, yes, well said. So uh, all men are born equally free, not created equal. Is that another epistemological point? Uh, in, a way, well, uh, in a way, maybe it is. Yeah, I mean, uh, all men are created equal. I mean, first of all, all men are not, all people are not equal uh, right. to begin with. Uh, and we're not created. There is no creator. So from, I guess you could say from an epistemological standpoint, based on reason and, and looking at the facts of reality. So in a reality 
oriented focus as opposed to a religious or a mystical focus that's that's a more more appropriate statement we're we're born we are we are born equally free or we should be at least born equally free and so that i think puts a, a better focus on on what the, the facts actually are yeah i mean it, to me it, it it eliminates a lot of confusion that exists uh in the equality debate today. And then finally, this is very important, I think. You say that among these rights are life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. The founders just said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I, I found this curious thinking about it because they were very aware, based on the work of John Locke and, and Jefferson, that property was the basis of other rights. Um, at least I think they were. I know John Locke was, was, and Jefferson were very aware of that. So why do you think they didn't put property into this um, declaration? Didn't use that word. Yeah. Why is I mean, it? Why did they have to leave it to you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not the only one who's thought of that, but, uh, yeah. but certainly, I mean. I, in my research, I never really found a solid reason as to why they left out property. Uh, it, perhaps it was just implied to, to them that that protecting life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness requires property. Uh, property is often though seen as somehow uh, somehow lower, you know, because it focuses on material values, and, and so maybe to some extent, obviously, the founders were religious. Uh, and, and so maybe they considered that a, a lesser or a lower right uh, that, that shouldn't be uh, uh, named. So that, that might be, uh, Daniel. I guess Daniel was uh, commenting there in the... <clears throat> oh, I missed, I missed the comment. I'm really bad at these chats. What was that... Uh... Uh, that that might be. I I I didn't uh, find that in my reading, but that that possibly could be uh, as to why uh, he's saying. I, I don't know if participants can see what what is being said in the chat. I think they can on YouTube, but you and I are on Zoom, so I. I'm okay, not, they can't. See oh, they, he, he Daniel says they cannot see. Okay, so he's saying the reason that property was excluded, so the southern states couldn't use it as a basis for slavery. I, I mean, that could be a possibility. Yeah, well. I, I had heard. I, I think I've heard that before. Um, so, um, yeah, that's. This might be a good time um, because uh, we're maybe a little bit behind where I wanted to be. This okay. might be a good time to, since, especially since Daniel interjected, uh, I can't see the chats, but Daniel, can you uh, tell us, are there any questions or chats or comments uh, have, that you want to interject now before we get into uh, money? We have a super chat from Bonnie, so thank you, Bonnie, but no questions so far. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. You're a stalwart, and I appreciate your, uh, your uh, attendance and support of these, uh, at these forums. Um, okay, so you spent a lot of time, Brian, on Article One of the Constitution, and uh, that's the powers of Congress. Um, and one of them, Article One, Section Eight, is the Commerce Clause, and you want to eliminate it altogether, as I remember right. But then you also have a replacement for it in one of the amendments, I believe, or, or not a, a replacement, but uh, something that addresses an issue of the commerce. Before I get tongue tied here, would you talk about your feeling on the Commerce Clause? The Commerce Clause was that the, that the Congress had the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. And I think mm -hmm. if it's a, among the several states, it's been a big source of controversy throughout our history. Right, right. And, and so, I mean, the original intent of the Commerce Clause was, was really to prevent the states from, from erecting barriers uh, to trade. But, but that's not how it's, it's been used, especially during the last uh, 90 years or so since, since the New Deal. It's, it's been used to, to increase regulations. But, but 
So, so I right, you're right. I propose to eliminate the commerce clause. I have other uh, changes to the Constitution that that'll help prevent the at all levels, federal, state, and local uh, levels of government. It'll prevent them from regulating. But, but even from early on in the history of the U.S., the commerce clause has been interpreted, I think, in a way that leads to greater regulation, uh, not limiting simply uh, barriers to trade by the state. So there was a case. Uh, in, uh, in early on, uh, it was uh, Gibbons versus Ogden in in 1824, where where the Supreme Court Chief Justice at the time, a very influential one, John Marshall, he stated uh, about the Commerce Clause that it's it's complete in itself. So, so I'm quoting here, and I, and I discuss this to some extent in the book. It may be exercised to its utmost extent and acknowledges no limitations other than are prescribed in the Constitution. And, and he went on to say that the wisdom and discretion of Congress and the influence that their co- constituents possess at elections are the sole restraints on which they have relied to secure it from its abuse. Uh, I mean, you know, if that's, if he's making such a statement, that to me uh, really can be used to justify more regulation. There's not much protection against violating rights, I think, in, in such a statement like that. And in fact, if voters want more regulations, you know, because he's talking about uh, protection based on on what the constituents want. If the voters want more regulation, it could justify greater regulation than based on the Commerce Clause. Uh, so, yeah. and, and oh, go ahead. No, I say so. Your your remedy for this is a in the Constitution is a eliminate the Commerce Clause, right? And then you have an amendment which really caught my eye, um, and the reason. I, it, it, two reasons it caught my eye. One is that it's a great amendment, but two, uh, when I first heard you were writing this book, Brian, the first thing I thought of was that one of the, one of the, in the closing section of Atlas Shrugged, right. the, the, uh, the various residents who have come to Galt's Gulch mm-hmm. are doing, you know, their little vignettes of them doing things. And one of them was Judge Narragansett is rewriting the Commerce Clause, or it it sounds like it, because what he says is almost exactly what you say here. No law, your first sentence of your uh, amendment, no law shall be made abridging the freedom and production of trade. And then you add, no law shall also be made abridging the freedom to choose to not trade with others. Right. So I'm curious, why you th- found it necessary to add that second ses- s- section, the freedom to choose not to trade with others. Is that because of things like, uh, I don't know, um, you know, ver- ver- various requirements that you cannot refuse service to certain people, uh, you know, based on uh, skin color and so forth. Right. I mean, yeah, uh, that's that's exactly it. Uh, not, th- not that you endorse excluding them well, skin color. That's not what I'm saying. I'm well, saying you endorse their right to trade or not to trade based only on their own choice. Right. I, I mean, I think that 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 amendment by Judge Narragansett is an extremely important amendment protecting the freedom of production and trade. And I think if there was one change made to the Constitution, that would be but probably the, the, one of the best uh, changes that could be made. But I think, yeah, that freedom to not trade with others is often violated. And, and this has to do with association as well, the right of association. And I think the right to not associate with others has to be protected uh, as well. So there, there have been many cases where, where the freedom to not trade or to not associate with others has been violated through anti-discrimination laws, affirmative action, and laws and and yeah, let me just just emphasize. You know, uh, I'm a staunch opponent of discrimination, say race uh, based on racism, but as long as people aren't initiating physical force, it's within the scope of their rights. Uh, I'm against you know, racism because it's it's irrational. You know, you're not ju- say if you were looking to hire somebody uh, as an employee, 
you know, you should be looking at their the things they have control over, their, whether they're responsible or irresponsible or ambitious or lazy, whether they work hard, you know, those kinds of characteristics, whether they have possessed the, the talent and ability to perform the, the duties of the job. Uh, so it's completely and utter, it, it's a form of determinism. It's completely and utterly irrational to be racist. But people, you know, it is within the scope of people's rights, including not trading with others for irrational reasons. So some of these cases are laws that force, say, bakers to uh, bake cakes for people in same-sex weddings. Uh, I I think that's a violation of rights. I, I, I don't support that. And I'm against that. I think people, if, if you're trading with others, you know, if they can buy the product, I'll, I'll sell it to them. Uh, but they have, it's within the scope of their rights to, to not trade with others or associate with others. And there have been some court cases. So, uh, so your point is basically the government cannot compel you to uh, act in ways that, that the only thing they can compel you to do is to not initiate force. If there's if that's the right formulation, yeah, right, uh, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly, they can't compel you to provide something to others that that you don't want to provide. It's, uh, it's only with with regard to a negative. They they can compel you to not violate rights, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I really am dying to talk about money. Um, so uh, let's get to that. Um, and okay. really, the only. Uh, references, there are very little reference in the Constitution to money. Uh, and uh, under the Constitution, the relationship between money and the government seems kind of ambiguous to me. Um, is government allowed to create money under the Constitution? Uh, I think a lot of people think it, 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 that the Constitution permits that. Uh, Article 1, Section 8 says that co- uh, Congress has the power to, quote, coin money and regulate the value thereof. Mm -hmm. And then in section 10 of article one, in powers denied to Congress, no state uh, shall coin money, emit bills of credit and make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. That all is a uh, a little confusing to me. Uh, Mm -hmm. can Can you untangle that? maybe by what the, what the founders intended and what we ended up with? Sure. I, I can certainly <clears throat> discuss that and try to untangle it. And, and Article 1, Section 8, those are the powers of, of Congress. Article 1, Section 10, those are, that section is restrictions on the states. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, powers denied to the states. Yes. Right. My, my bad. Yeah. So Article 1, uh, Section 8, I mean, I, I think if you look at that, it really does give the power to the government the federal government to create money because it says one of their powers is to coin money and regulate the value thereof. Uh, so I think. Okay. So that- I want to, can I, can I stop you right there? Sure. Traditionally coining money meant, I think that you brought your bullion to the coin maker. So you brought your, your, you brought your gold and silver and they stamped it out into a, uh, you know, a, a standard coin. Right. that was of standard weight and measure and so forth. And that's consistent with the other uh, element of that uh, clause that says that the government establishes weights and measures. Right. Uh, so could it be interpreted that way? And has it been interpreted that way that, that really all they were doing is all they had the power to do was to coin money to make it a, 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 a uniform or standard unit of exchange. Right. And I think it can be interpreted that way. Uh, and, and for a long time, it, or at least to some extent, it has been interpreted that way. But, but that's one issue I found in reading the Constitution. You know, a lot of things are just left implicit in terms of uh, what the powers of Congress are. And so one thing I found myself doing is, is protecting rights and, and freedoms in a much more explicit fashion with the changes that, that I was making, actually stating. And I think one, a, a good example is that is with Judge Narragansett's uh, 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 clause uh, that no abridging the freedom of production and trade, making that, those types of protections explicit, goes a much longer way 
to protecting rights. And, and obviously, as the philosophical climate changes, uh, things, and we're moving, you know, to much more status, and we're in a much more status philosophical climate. So things, if they're not stated explicitly, can be interpreted in a much more statist fashion. And, mm-hmm. and so I think that that's where I'm saying that that Article 1, Section 8, I mean, it, you could read that as being able to create money. You're regulating the value of it. That's so not just coining it and it's stamping it. It's regulating the value of it, uh, yeah. uh, which which is open. Like the Commerce Clause was interpreted by by Chief, Chief Justice John Marshall. Uh, it can be interpreted very widely. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear that uh, Congress eventually interpreted it as, you know, as the ability to create money because... Uh, you know, I'm very familiar, or, or not very, I'm pretty familiar with the um, legislation, subsequent legislation adopted by the Congress that, you know, in terms of um, uh, incorporating and chartering national banks, it gives them, it gives national banks and solely national banks, and then later by amendment uh, state banks, the mm-hmm. ability to uh, discount bills. And to, you know, basically to extend credit. And so, um, which has been interpreted as kind of money from nothing. Uh, and so, um, it's, inter- it's interesting that, uh, you know, the Congress seemed to interpret it that way, too. And that's been our evolution of money. Now, right. do, you, do you agree, Brian, that the, uh, about the origin of money, uh, uh, the basic Carl Menger account that, uh, you know, money most likely evolved out of barter, and then eventually we got the most marketable good, which was you know gold and silver, precious metals, for all the reasons that we've we've studied of why you know they were the most desirable money. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Certainly, money evolving out of barter, indirect barter, right, and some yeah. some items being used more and more, and so people wanted to acquire those things, not because they wanted those things, you know, including precious metals or shells or whatever it might be, but that they started to acquire them because others wanted them. And so the reasoning, the reasoning behind uh, this would be, this would be free market money. This, this money developed, uh, some would say spontaneously, but it developed in the marketplace through common usage and became, and became, you know, it's known as money, more or less without uh, government imprimatur. And uh, is, that, is that the way you say it? In other words, you don't need government. What I'm getting at is what's the relationship between government and money? You don't, you don't agree, and I don't, that government should create money, but, but government has to recognize money in some way. And so is there, is their job merely to enforce contracts? Uh, merely, is, that's not a, a mere thing really. Is that, right. is, that the, is that the job of government when it comes to money? People can transact however they want. And because, uh, because a violation of a contract would be tantamount or would be fraud, you can, the government should protect us against force and fraud and therefore that's the government's job. That's what one big reason we have government to enforce reasonable contracts among among human beings. Basically, contractual rights. Yeah, rights that yeah. Uh, that you've obtained by agreeing to trade it through and and creating a contract with that. So one party agrees to provide something and the other party agrees to pay for it. So those are contractual rights that yeah, need to be protected. And, and I think that's, that's what the government does. For instance, that, that article one, section eight, uh, that, that, that talks about coining money. I, I think that needs to be changed to Congress has the power to make money that has been widely accepted in the marketplace, a tender and payment of debts. But individuals may use alternative money if agreed upon. And that's, that's and I make a similar change in, in Section 10 as well with regard to the states. So I think it, government has to, to, it has to recognize something as a means of payment. And, and that can be done through court cases and codified through statute. Uh, you know, because if there's a disagreement over what's to be used, then then that uh, people need to be able to seek redress uh, through the government to to you know have have the rights protected. Uh, but I I, I I do add another. So in that Article One, Section Eight, and Section Ten, I add provisions 
in, from that standpoint. But I also have another amendment which very rigidly restricts the the government, you know, at any level to uh, the, so that it can't create money. It has to recognize only what's in the marketplace, and I think that would prevent lots of violations of rights because you know. Uh, the, the rise of fiat money has uh, has been a part of the expansion of government. You, the, they can create money to expand the welfare state, the regulatory states, uh, and just interfere in the marketplace in general much more than they otherwise would be able to. Oh yeah, I mean, I think the the power to be a, create money is the power to rule. I mean, practically, uh, it's it's a it's a huge huge privilege and abuse. Um, so government, in your view, would then use, because government, even minimal government has to transact in, you know, among commercially. Right. Uh, it, has to, it has to pay its soldiers. They got to collect, you know, minimum amount of taxes, whether voluntary or not. Uh, you know, various, various things got to pay its administrative state and, and so forth. Uh, so government, I presume, would use would not decree which money to use, it would use a highly accepted, widely used monetary unit, you know, in the marketplace. Is that the idea? Right. I mean, they obviously would have to use money to pay employees and purchase uh, goods, military hardware. So they would be accepting what's in you accepting what's in the marketplace and, and i think that would tend to be gold and precious metals uh but but that could entail also banknotes as well private banknotes i don't think the government should be able to create banknotes but private banks that are uh, widely used they would accept them and uh, use them uh, I, I do as a part of my provisions though with regard to money i think the government should be restricted uh, from using anything that's that's not backed 100% by what I call standard money. So, because, and, and that gets into some other issues, but it, when they- But so basically they, the marketplace, the marketplace would determine what the standard money is, correct? Right, and and on a gold standard, gold is standard money. It's right. what the ultimate debt paying power. Uh, and so, you know, it would be restricted to accepting gold or it could be banknotes backed by gold. But if it's not fully right. backed, if banknotes are not fully backed by gold, then basically the government puts itself in the position of a lender, uh, a lender to the bank and, and implicitly a lender to whoever the bank's lending money to. Uh, and I don't think the government should be doing any lending whatsoever, you know, not to college students or farmers or small businesses or other countries, you know, and there's a restriction, a provision that restricts the government from doing that well that I... Uh, how that about is. government, how about government borrowing, borrowing from the populace, selling bonds, you know, and so forth? Yeah, I think that's appropriate. Uh, that could make sense to to build, say, an aircraft carrier. They don't have all the funds on hand, but you know they do have an expected stream of revenue that would come in, and being able to borrow on that. Yeah, I, I think borrowing is is completely appropriate, but not not lending. Borrowing is consistent with the the the, gov the government's proper purpose of protecting rights, but lending. No, it's usually usually trying to provide people funds that they couldn't otherwise get in the marketplace is what it is. Or obviously paying off the uh, borrowing by creating money, um, you know, monetizing the debt. Obviously, that's out in your view uh, because, you know, the government can't create money under in your view. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. Um, well, I like this world. I like I like the picture of this world you're, you're painting. Uh, now we have a we're 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 getting a little short on time, so I'm going to ask Daniel if there's any chats or comments before um, I ask you one more question and uh, then wrap up. Okay. Uh, Daniel, do we have anything? No more from questions. the no more questions. Okay, um, I I just have to get in in a few minutes uh, your basic views on the Second Amendment on owning guns. Now a lot of our uh, compatriots, especially objectivists, uh, seem to say that um, you have a right to own a gun just like you have a right to own any other property. And I think that's certainly true. But why do you think the founders had to make it, or it felt compelled, felt it important to make uh, the right to bear arms a separate 
amendment, a separate enumerated right in the in the Bill of Rights, in the first 10 amendments to the Constitution? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a an extremely important right for protecting yourself and, and ultimately defending yourself against government's uh, harms that could be created. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the current Second Amendment focuses on the idea is a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, so providing that ability to individuals to protect themselves from governments, ultimately, I think, is a, it was an important part of, of that, that Second Amendment. Yeah, so that's really interesting. It raises a, a few uh, questions. And one is, uh, you know, the government is technologically much more powerful than any individual. We don't have a chance against them. You know, it's like us, uh, even if we have an AR-15, they've got bazookas uh, and they got tactical forces and they got Navy SEALs and they got all those guys they can use against us if we want. What chance do we have against them? So what good is it? To, they will never, we can't have, we can't have uh, in personal possession force equivalent to the government. You know, we can't have aircraft carriers and, and nuclear weapons and so forth as you state in your book. So does, does that in any way moot or mute the, uh, I, the idea of protecting yourself against abuse by uh, physical abuse by the government. Right. Uh, well, I mean, the fact is, uh, and, and many writers on the Second Amendment have pointed this out, that governments are hesitant to use the force that they're able to use or that they could possibly use, especially against their own people, if, right. if you're talking about a, a government uh, oppressing its own people. And so the the arms that people can possess, I think, do provide a deterrent, even though, yeah, if many governments today wanted to uh, destroy their own people, they could drop nuclear bombs uh, on, on their people. But they're very hesitant to do that. Uh, and, and so I think that right to bear arms and keep arms is important and does deter governments from, from using more force than they otherwise would. Because if you look at, for instance, uh, dictators, one of the first things they offer Often do is try to disarm the the population and absolutely and it, it, even though you might not have nuclear weapons uh, you know it becomes very difficult if you have look at look at the U.S. going into say Iraq and, and Afghanistan it becomes very difficult dealing with the population if they are are arms yeah uh, first two things you do I guess if you're a smart dictator is disarm the people and take over the media Boy, I mean, yeah. I, I, I guess um, there's so much more we could say. We only have just a couple minutes left. So I do want to uh, give us give you a chance, Brian, to uh, talk about where people can uh, get your work and get your books, because this has been fascinating. We didn't have enough time. But uh, you do a blog, right? Would you tell everyone where it is? And by the way, when you're done with this, I'm going to repost this on uh, YouTube or, or on uh, my blog. And I'll, in addition, I'll, I'll uh, reference your uh, websites and your, and, and your book. But go ahead. How can people reach you? Sure. Uh, well, they, they could reach me by email at bsimpson at nu.edu if they want oh, to. Oh, boy, they can get you. But say that again, bsimpson at, e, B, at B Simpson. At nu.edu. That's that's my email address. That would be the most direct way. But I do awesome. have a web, a website, brian-simpson.com, and and there is a blog there. I, I do post uh, 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 you know articles that I, I get published and things like that. But I, I'm, I will be posting about this interview as well there. Uh, so they can. There is a way to a form that can be filled out to contact me there uh, as well. The books, uh, you know, so there are four books that I've written uh, you meant, that you mentioned, Markets Don't Fail, Money Banking in the Business Cycle, and Volumes 1 and 2, they're really written as separate book books, and then A Declaration and Constitution for a Free Society. They're all available via Amazon. Uh, 
the Markets Don't Fail and, and the Declaration and Constitution book are, were both published through Lexington Books, uh, so you could get them through uh, the, the publisher's website. Then, then Money Banking in the Business Cycle was published by Paul Grave Macmillan, uh, so you can get both volumes through through their website. But certainly, Amazon has has all these books uh, as well. Yeah, well, so, I, I mean, this this latest book is. Uh, all of them, all of your books are well worthwhile. Uh, I've been through them all, uh, but this one in particular, I think, has widespread appeal to everyone, uh, and I hope everyone will take advantage of it. Wow, we are going to finish right on time, so Daniel can go right to the next uh, program. Brian, thank you very much. This has been so much fun for me, uh, and I hope everyone enjoys it, and I'll, we'll, we'll uh, broadcast this out as much as possible. Thanks, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Jim. You too. All right.